So today I want to talk about the scope of the Dharmasar teaching. Now, if you really want to know all about this, go look in the video description and download the catalog, the video index document, because that explains in more detail than I have time during this short video exactly what we teach on this channel. But I want to talk a little bit about my history and how I came to be the person I am today. So this journey started for me on the East Coast of the United States, just outside New York City. That's where I had my first awakening at age three, and that's where I went to music school and got a degree in musical composition. And that's where I started as a composer and performer of jazz and classical music. And by playing gigs, I worked my way through school. A lot of us did. That was back during the days when you had actually live musicians <laughs> instead of just recordings like now. So then I went out to the West Coast, and there I studied Indian music and kirtan, sacred music, kirtan bhajan, with Ustad Ali Akbar Khan. He's one of the great maestros of Indian music and uh, was actually a co-student of uh, Ravi Shankar, but Ravi Shankar was more or less an outsider. He was a dancer who became a musician, whereas Ali Akbar was the son of the great master, Alauddin Khan. And so I got a very good grounding in Indian music from him. Then I went to New Mexico and I uh, became involved with the Native Americans and their spiritual practices. And this was the first really intense spiritual training that I had. And as intense it was. <laughs> so I did the sun dance and I did lots and lots of fire rituals, also known as sweat lodge. But it's not really about the sweat, it's about the fire and the stone people who carry the fire. And uh, after that, I was studying Kedoshka, Native American Kedoshka, which is a Navajo mystical practice similar to Tantra. Then, later on, I went down into Mexico and studied with the Huichol Indians, their uh, psychedelic uh, spiritual rituals. And that's where I became acquainted with uh, sacred mushrooms and like that. Then fast forward a few years, I had met my guru in 1967. I was introduced by Ali Akbar Khan to Srila Prabhupada, but I wasn't ready to join his organization just yet. So I waited like four years and did all these other things. Then finally, I went to him and surrendered. And he said, come with me to India. So I did. I went to Vrindavan, India, one of the premier holy places, a sacred tirtha or place of pilgrimage dedicated to Lord Krishna. And after Prabhupada passed away, I traveled north to Kashmir and I studied Kashmiri Shaivism and their Tantra tradition. That was a real eye-opener, believe me, <laughs> because it showed me that 
Actually, the goddess is the root of all incarnations and also expands into their forms. And one day I'm going to do a video and explain that in detail. But right now I don't have time to do all the research and collect all the quotes. But take it from me, the scriptures confirm in many places that she is the actual source or the form of the different incarnations of God. So after that, I went to East India, or Bengal, and I lived there in a farm community where there was also a school, and I was one of the teachers for a while, but mainly I was a musician there, did a lot of temple kirtans, traveled all over India from there as a base, and uh, that's kind of the kirtan capital of India. And so I got a lot of experience there, very wonderful experiences. But I went back to the U.S. because I couldn't find really a place where I fit in. And I wound up visiting Osho Rajneesh in Portland or near Portland in the desert. And I spent about six months on the Rancho Rajneesh. And uh, I didn't do much of anything except meditate. And finally, the, the management there, they didn't like me <laughs> because I don't fit in well with any organizations. So I left there and I went to Portland and sat in my apartment for like six weeks, just doing nothing but meditation. And that was 1984 when I got first path realization. So from there, I went bumming around the South Pacific, and I lived in Hawaii for a while. Um, again, just doing lots of sadhana, lots of chanting and meditation. But the real the next step for me was to come back to India and then wind up in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is where I studied Theravada Buddhism. Now, for those who don't know much about Buddhism, this is called Southern Buddhism. And it's very strictly based on the Buddha suttas, or at least it's supposed to be. But there were a lot of later editions that kind of messed things up. But it's definitely very different from Northern Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism, so-called. But actually, Buddhism in the north of India, Nepal, and Tibet is pretty much all the same. And they basically grafted the Buddha's teaching onto the Vedic teachings. And so it's a little bit, you know, of a hybrid thing. And it's become very academic, um, not so much about the practice, but about the knowledge. I was after the practice. So I went to the uh, forest monasteries in Sri Lanka and studied there with Bhikkhu Nyanananda and others like him. But after Nyanananda passed away, I found myself with wanderlust again. <laughs> so I came back to India and looked around here and there and finally wound up in Tiruvannamalai, where I went deep into the teaching of Ramana Maharshi. Adwaita. And, uh, oh, I forgot to mention that in San Francisco in the uh, early 80s, I had studied with a realized teacher of Chan Buddhism. Chan means Zen. Uh, in India, it's called Dhyan. In China, Chan. In Japan, Zen. But it's the same thing. It's meditation. So I studied Qigong, Shaolin Iron Shirt Qigong with her, and then also the meditation, which was kind of a bonus, huh? free bonus that she threw in there. Her husband was one of the great Zen masters in Japan. And they, they fled from China 
to Taiwan at the Cultural Revolution and wound up in the U.S. in San Francisco. So I had studied all these things, not only with native teachers, but in their native cultures as well. When I was on Guam, there's a huge Chinese community on Guam, and I worked and lived pretty much among them and practiced the Qigong that I had learned and even taught a little bit. But in those days, I wasn't so interested in teaching as I was in learning. Because when I had the realization in 1984, honestly, I didn't understand what happened to me. It was wild. I didn't have the background. Uh, I had the experience, but not the knowledge. So it took me a long time, almost 30 years, to get deep enough into the knowledge of the Buddha's teaching and Advaita to finally understand what had happened. Then I felt comfortable about teaching. And so I started making these videos about 10 years ago. And my aim from the beginning was to make a postgraduate level course in all aspects of spirituality. So as a result, after learning all these things and then sharing them on the internet here, I came to call this Dharma Sar, the essence of Dharma. And in the essence of Dharma, there are certain things that we know well, that we have practiced deeply, and that we feel comfortable teaching. And these are listed on the left-hand side. Classical music and jazz, Vedic Raga and Kirtan, Zen meditation, Navajo Kidoshka, Shaolin Qigong, Kundalini Yoga, Hui Chol Mysticism, Vaishnava Bhakti, Kashmiri Shaivism and Tantra, the Theravada Suttas, the Advaita Vedanta, and Sri Vidya. And all this is based on and communicated through a process of ontological analysis, which is something we go into in many of our early series, especially Becoming Genius, or Matrix Learning, as it used to be called. But along with that, there are certain things that we do not teach and will not teach because they disagree with our views, with our philosophy, and our experience. And these are things like rock and roll music, <laughs> made up mantras or commercially sold mantras, so-called mindfulness, which has very little to do with the Buddha's original teaching of mindfulness. We went into that in the series on Maha Satipatthana Sutta. You can look that up. Or atheistic so-called Tantra. Tantra, without worship of the goddess, is just sexual indulgence. It's nonsense. Uh, you have to start from worship of the goddess, Sri Vidya, and that's also one of the things that we teach. I don't teach martial arts because I don't have the heart to hurt anyone. And we don't teach any path, such as some of the Tibetan paths, that involve over-austerity or over-endeavor. Because first of all, nobody today in the West is going to do these things, huh? Sit in a cave for years, fasting and meditating. Like, nobody's going to do that, okay? <laughs> so, what's the use of teaching? And also, it's over-endeavor. It's too much effort. And because of that, one tends to identify with the body and mind again. So it kind of short circuits its own purpose. We don't teach the use of recreational drugs, only psychedelics used in a sacred uh, mindset. And actually, I don't practice this anymore either. So it's for the young and strong. Uh, we don't teach any religious fanaticism. When I was in ISKCON, Srila Prabhupada's organization, 
I got up to here with the fanaticism that denies the validity of other teachings, sectarianism, uh, this whole argumentative attitude. And of course, that leads to denying people as well, denying the intelligence of women, denying any kind of alternative sexuality, and especially denying people who worship other gods than Krishna. Now, there are some religious paths that I won't teach because I think they're made up, especially any path that's sectarian or fanatical. No way am I going to teach it. And same goes for chauvinism, racism, sexism. I don't teach Tibetan Buddhism for the reasons I already gave. And most of all, I don't teach Neo-Advaita. I've seen here in Tiruvannamalai the destruction that Neo-Advaita has caused and how many people are misled into just becoming a, almost like a slave of these teachers who charge huge amounts of money for their seminars but don't give any lasting result. So it's a con game. I want no part of it. And last of all, I don't teach dogma. Like, this is the way it is, and this is the only way it is. No. That doesn't work for me, and I'm pretty sure it doesn't work for you either. Only a very insecure and ignorant person is going to take shelter of a path that advocates dogma. Because basically they want to be told what to think, what to do, how to live. But we view the person as a sacred and sovereign individual. You have the right to make up your own mind, to think for yourself, and to take action according to your conscience. So, these are the things we teach and the things we don't teach. We don't like to criticize people, but we do sometimes criticize teachings that we think are wrong, that contain falsehoods or misinformation. So some people think that we're hard-hearted or cold-hearted for not just embracing everything and everyone. But factually speaking, some of these paths are very dangerous, and we have seen the destruction they cause, and we don't want to be a part of that. So we offer them our respects from far, far away. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.